In the summer of 1937, some of General Alexander von Falkenhausen's 80,000 German-trained nationalist Chinese soldiers were trying to hold back the Japanese. The men were equipped with German Mausers, Stahlhelms, artillery pieces, and 15 Panzer Ones, and had been trained by some of the best generals in the German forces. The elite soldiers had taken positions on the outskirts of Nanjing and were steadily resisting the bombardments and heavy blows of the Japanese artillery. Wave after wave, the Chinese fought bravely, but they soon discovered that their sole armored division was being torn to pieces by Japanese tanks. Even so, they wouldn't give up so easily. Industrializing China China has had a long history of relations with European powers, dating back to the 18th century. But it was during the turbulent 19th century, the age of large-scale colonization by the British and French empires, that China was forced to commerce and cede some of its lands to the world's superpowers. In the aftermath of the Opium Wars, in which China was obliged to allow the British commerce of opium in the country, formal commerce relations were opened with other European states, including Prussia. Then, in 1890, the Deutsche Asiatische Bank was established under German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck to finance the modernization of China. Besides helping with the construction of railways and infrastructure, Prussians also developed two powerful pre-dreadnought ships for the Beiyang fleet of the Qing dynasty. They were Zhenyuan and Dingyuan, built by the German shipyard AG Vulkansletten. Even so, the efforts were of little use against the superior military prowess of the Japanese during the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894. The Qing Dynasty's attempts to modernize its military fell short of Japan's powerful Meiji Restoration. As a result, dominance in Asia shifted from China to the Empire of the Rising Sun for the first time in centuries. Firmly convinced that there was still hope for his country to take back its former place, Chinese General Yuan Shikai requested the Prussians for support in military, industrial, and technological matters to strengthen the Chinese armies. Deteriorating Relations Kaiser Wilhelm's thirst for a Prussian Empire quickly changed Bismarck's policies of cooperation and his desire to avoid any colonization efforts. During the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, the Kaiser sent a contingent of troops to avenge the assassination of the German minister to China, Baron Clemens von Kettler, and other German civilians. Rampant plundering by the American, British, French, and other European armies in China soon followed. However, Wilhelm II stirred some controversy because he told his troops they should behave like Hun invaders to avenge their countrymen. From then on, Sino-German relations declined rapidly. Prussia then attempted to negotiate a German-Chinese alliance after the British signed the Anglo-Japanese one in 1907, but it did not proceed. During World War I, Prussia offered China to give them Kiao Bay back if they could repel the Allies. The Chinese were convinced, but the Japanese soon invaded Kiao as part of the siege of Tsingtao. Even worse, the Chinese declared war on Germany in August of 1917 to recover the concession of Hankou and Tianjin. However, Japan was given preference over China during the Paris Peace Conference, and both territories became part of the Japanese Empire. This turn of events led to the reconciliation of the Chinese and Germans, uniting them against their common enemy. Chinese Civil War Although the unforgiving Treaty of Versailles prevented the 100,000-strong German army of the Weimar Republic from increasing military personnel and developing military technology, the young republic found cunning ways to liberate itself from the restrictions. One such example was the secret Soviet-German Military Pact of 1922, which allowed Germany to develop aircraft, tanks, and other technology deep inside the Soviet Union in exchange for training Soviet soldiers for warfare. The Reichswehr also created industrial firms and signed partnerships with other nations to keep their armaments industry afloat. As this was happening, the Emperor of China passed away, and the Beiyang government collapsed. This led to a gruesome Chinese civil war in which local warlords rose in arms to compete for territorial conquests. Weaponry of all origins began to pour into China to support the local warlords, 
and Germany wanted to participate one way or the other. The Kuomintang, or Chinese Nationalist Party, wished to end all the bloodshed and unite China under one banner to shield the nation from the depredations of the hungry Japanese Empire. As such, General Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Nationalist Party, asked the Weimar Republic for over 50 German advisors to instruct his armies and prepare them for combat. World War I veteran Colonel Max Bauer then arrived in China and became Chiang Kai-shek's advisor. With his help and that of the German advisors, the general was able to unify China in 1929 after defeating the last warlords. Nevertheless, he now needed to prepare his soldiers from an even more significant threat that had expanded from the north, communism. German advisors. The Weimar Republic did not officially acknowledge the presence of military advisors in China, and Colonel Bauer succumbed to smallpox shortly after the triumph of the Nationalist Party. He was succeeded by General Georg Wetzel. Wetzel increased the flow of German rifles and equipment to support Chiang Kai-shek in his fight against the Communists during the Shanghai War of 1932. He also suggested establishing an artillery school to train the Chinese in all types of artillery pieces. During these combat encounters, Japanese aircraft bombed Shanghai in retaliation for riots against some of their businesses. Consequently, the German advisors engaged Japanese forces for the first time in history before a League of Nations ceasefire agreement. When Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Party rose to power in 1933, the future Führer promised more economic and military support to fight communism and modernize China. These promises were formalized when Chinese Premier H. H. Kung visited Hitler and discussed the situation in China. Then in May, General Hans von Zecht was sent to Shanghai to reorganize the Nationalist Army and turn it into a small but professional fighting force. Zecht, another veteran of the brutal combat of trench warfare, firmly believed that the success of the Nationalist Army relied on swift movements across the vast Chinese landscape to suffocate the pockets of communists and Japanese. Besides instructing the Chinese forces in the art of war, General Zecht made sure to properly equip his small but elite force with the best weaponry available. Armed by the Reich The influx of German equipment began to steadily modernize the troops of Chiang Kai-shek. Based on documents from both the Germans and the Nationalists, it is estimated that more than 60% of the general's war resources were German. From Mauser 98 rifles, to the iconic and battle-tested Stahlhelm, standard-issue German uniforms and hand grenades, the Nationalist Army looked and fought as if led by Germans. Their machine guns, artillery pieces of all calibers, aircraft, and panzers quickly turned the Nationalist Army into a small but formidable force. Meanwhile, the Chinese Nationalist Air Force acquired some Junkers Ju-52 3Ms. The aircraft had a capacity for 17 seats, ideal for Chiang Kai-shek's personal transport and that of his German advisors. The Ju-52 3M was also used for moving supplies from one garrison to another, and although somewhat underpowered, over 11 Henkel HE-111A bombers were also acquired by the Nationalists to rain hell on the opposition. The first variant of the German bomber was armed with a frontal 7.92mm MG-15 machine gun, a central MG on top of the fuselage, and a third in a ventral position as a retractable turret. Also, the bomb bay was split into two compartments and had a capacity of 680 kilograms. Chinese Panzers In 1936, Zecht and the Third Reich supplied the Nationalist Army with over 15 Panzerkampfwagen 1 or Panzer 1A tanks. The Chinese engineers from the 3rd Armored Battalion received proper training before the Panzers were integrated into the unit. The Panzer I was developed in 1934 and was mass-produced as a training tank to prepare tank men for a new age of armored warfare. The vehicle had a mass of 5.5 tons, a length of 4 meters, a width of 2 meters, and a height of 1.72 meters. These Panzer Ones would eventually see action during the Battle of Nanking in December of 1937 against the Imperial Japanese Army. They served along with other tanks of European origin, such as the British Mark VI Carden Lloyd Tankette, French Renault FTs, the small but reliable Vickers six-ton tank, 
and the Italian CV-35 light scout tank. Chiang Kai-shek's government paid over 1 million Reichsmarks, or $30 million in today's currency, for the Panzer I tanks, but they arrived in lackluster conditions, with rusty parts and damaged components. Even so, they were rushed into service for the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in the summer of 1937, which proved fatal, as some tanks were bogged down and could not function appropriately over muddy terrain. Falkenhausen's 80,000 As the Japanese poured into China by the thousands, General Alexander von Falkenhausen, the final leader of the Wehrmacht Advisory Board, was pressed by the nationalists to finish the training of over 80,000 troops split into eight divisions. These soldiers were expected to be the best of the best of the nationalist army, but they were not able to reach their desired experience level before they were thrown into the fray in July of 1937. Falkenhausen was then forced to release his elite Chinese troops to stop the Japanese at Wanping near Beijing, where they suffered severe casualties but put up a stiff fight against the overwhelming Japanese forces. Many of the losses were from the German-trained 88th Division. All the same, Falkenhausen continued to provide advice for a long-term fight with the Japanese, establishing guerrillas behind Japanese front lines, building strategic fortifications, and withdrawing his troops from the capital to temporarily fight a war of attrition against the invader. Even so, the 3rd Armored Division didn't fare well against the Japanese during the battles of Shanghai and Nanjing, and were mostly wiped out when pitched against proper Japanese armored divisions. Meanwhile, the surviving Panzer Ones were withdrawn from the battlefield and repaired with spare Soviet parts and DP machine guns. An Alliance Eventually, Chiang Kai-shek ordered all his forces to defend Nanjing from the Japanese, contrary to Falkenhausen's advice. Thus, the 150,000-strong Chinese garrison was pitched against a relentless Japanese garrison of over 50,000 that were better equipped and had superior armor and air superiority. In early December of 1937, the Japanese penetrated the city and gave way to the Nanjing Massacre, destroying it all, along with its population. After that, some of the Panzer Ones were taken to Japan as war trophies, where they were put on public display. Notably, all German advisors and soldiers survived the conflict and returned to Germany. Not a single German casualty was reported. In 1938, both the Third Reich and Japan began diplomatic conversations to form an alliance that effectively left the nationalists standing alone against the overwhelming odds of the communists and the Japanese. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up and hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos. Stay tuned.